There's something different about this cycloidal reducer. And though it may not look like much from the outside, there's something very unique going on that we can only see from the inside. But we'll get to that in due time. So if you haven't heard, cycloidal drives are magical. And if you've been hanging around Maker YouTube for any length of time, then you've probably stumbled across a video or 10 about them. They have been all the rage in speed reducers, and for very good reason. Properly manufactured, they have very little backlash. And for prototyping, they're relatively easy to manufacture. And the benefits don't stop there. Traditional gears usually only have a few teeth in contact with each other at any given time, which makes the teeth the weak link. So gears need to be built strong enough to manage all that torque coming down to a small pressure point. Cycloidal drives don't have this issue. In theory, the contact is nicely distributed between all the rollers and the cycloidal discs. As I said, there are a ton of videos on how cycloidal drives work. So I'm gonna keep this next part really brief and quickly go over the basic parts just to get us on the same page. Basically, there's the outer stationary ring with a number of rollers, an output ring that contains a number of pins, then the cycloidal disc itself, and finally an eccentric shaft as the input to the reducer. For this example, we have eight rollers in the outer ring and seven lobes on our cycloidal disc. To keep it simple, the reduction ratio is determined by the number of lobes over the number of rollers minus the number of lobes. And this is almost always one. So in this case, the output ring is rotating seven times slower than the input. And this is all great, but the eccentric rotation of the cycloidal disc is a big unbalanced mass, and this causes vibration. So to counteract this, we use two identical cycloidal discs running 180 degrees out of phase with each other to help provide a counterbalance. And this mostly takes care of the vibration issues. So as I see it, this design has two major flaws. The first is that we've added a bunch of complexity and mass in the form of that second cycloidal disc and its rollers and shaft. Remember, its only purpose is to help balance the load. The second problem is that this design becomes hard to scale if you want to increase your reduction ratio. If you need more reduction, you basically have two options. The first is to increase the number of rollers, but this very quickly becomes difficult to do without starting to increase the size of the drive as well. Plus, you're adding weight in the form of more rollers, more complexity, etc. The second option is to stack two drives on top of each other and create a two-stage gearbox. And this is awesome because it means we've unlocked the power of multiplication. So our seven to one now becomes a whopping 49 to one. The downside is that we've literally doubled the mass and of course increased the number of parts we need. Sure, you can get clever with the design and maybe combine them into one housing, maybe reduce the size of the first stage to lower mass, etc. But what if there were a better way? Well, thanks to the fine folks at the University of Kragujats, there just might be. And I'm sorry if I butchered that name. So I'm browsing the web one night, searching for the inner secrets of cycloidal reducer design, as one does, when I stumbled across this little gem. And let me tell you, research papers can be a gold mine of useful information. You just have to somehow translate them. But before I get into all of that, previous viewers of my channel might have noticed that my desktop here has gotten a bit of an upgrade. And that's thanks to this video's sponsor, FlexiSpot. That's right, this channel's moving up in the world. And I mean that quite literally, thanks to FlexiSpot's height adjustable E7L premium standing desk. And this desk is awesome, both in the shop or the office. This version features a bamboo desktop, which is durable and attractive. And the L shape gives me a lot of flexibility to arrange my workspace as I need. And it turns out that having a ton of height adjustability in a work surface is really handy. And the ability to work while standing is perfect for giving my back a break. The three leg triple motor design accommodates over 330 pounds, which is probably more than you'll ever need. But what that does mean is that this desk is amazingly stable, even at taller heights, which is essential for any work surface. 
and FlexiSpot also offers a variety of accessories, like this PS015, which cleverly clamps to the desktop and provides a variety of quick power options. The FlexiSpot Black Friday sale begins now. Use my code YTE7P50 to get extra discounts and get your own L-shaped standing desk. Thanks so much to FlexiSpot. Let's jump back in. So to help explain what this paper is all about, I'm going to tell a story of a completely hypothetical nature that probably has no basis in reality, but hopefully helps explain the concepts the paper proposes. So let's put ourselves in the place of these researchers pondering the traditional cycloidal drive design. And as we're pondering, we might think to ourselves, we have these two useless appendages in the form of these extra cycloidal discs. What if we just amputated them? Well, if you simply remove one disc from each of the stages, they will not counterbalance each other since they're moving at different speeds. So what we need to figure out is a way to make both of these discs move at the same speed, while at the same time maintaining that multiplication factor by stacking the two stages. So let's reframe the way we usually think about cycloidal drives, this time starting with a six to one for reasons that will soon become apparent. And this time, let's not be so rigid and let's rethink what we traditionally consider the output of a cycloidal drive. Let's instead think of these parts as an inner ring and an outer ring. And we can see this more clearly by locking down the inner ring. And suddenly we're seeing a very different behavior. Now it's the outside ring that's rotating, but our ratio has changed slightly. We're actually going a little slower and have made a seven to one reduction. Well, that's kind of interesting. We've achieved the same reduction ratio we had in our original example, but the equation has changed and now it's the number of rollers that determines the reduction ratio. Even more interesting is what happens when we don't lock down that inner ring, but instead rotate it in the opposite direction at a ratio of seven to one. Well, now suddenly that outer ring is spinning at a ratio of 49 to one. Wait, what? That's the same output as the two stage design we originally looked at. And why are we spinning that inner ring at a seven to one ratio? Well, let's remember that original goal of getting our second stage cycloidal disc to rotate at the same speed as the first one. And again, if we go back to that original example, we had an output of seven to one after the first stage. And conveniently, the inner ring on our new cycloidal just so happens to perfectly match with that original output. So when you combine the two, the result is kind of amazing. Yep, it's a two-stage cycloidal where both discs are rotating at the same speed and therefore balancing each other out. And the total output multiplies out to 49 to one. Yes, the shapes of the two discs are different, but you could adjust things like thickness to keep the masses equal. So seven to one, six to one, are these just arbitrary numbers? Well, to explain all this, we have to do some math. I know, I'm sorry, but I promise this is actually pretty simple. Basically, our equation for the total reduction ratio has changed once again. Now, it's the output ratio of the first stage multiplied by the output ratio of the second stage. And remember, we determined that the output of stage two was actually now based on the number of rollers in the outer ring, as opposed to the number of lobes. To frame it another way, our equation now looks more like this. The number of lobes in stage one multiplied by the number of rollers in stage two. Now there's actually a bit more to it than this. So let's take a look at the whole equation. And what's that bit we added to the bottom? Well, that's the difference between the lobe counts of the two stages. So this isn't much of a factor for this example. And when we plug in our numbers, we take the seven lobes from stage one minus the six lobes from stage two, which equals one. And 49 to one is the final reduction. But this does start to matter if we plug in some different numbers. So let's try eight lobes on stage one and we'll keep the seven rollers on stage two. Then we take the eight lobes on stage one and subtract the six lobes from stage two, giving us a reduction of 56 over two or 28 to one. 
And you can go the other way too. So let's try five lobes on the first stage and again keep stage two the same. But now we take the five lobes of stage one and subtract the six lobes from stage two and we get negative one. So the reducer becomes 35 to one, but the output now spins in the opposite direction from the input, hence the negative. You can play with these numbers in all sorts of ways and have fun with the math to come up with interesting combos. But see if you can guess what happens if we try and use the same number of lobes for both stages. So this covers the design as shown in the paper. And do I know if this is how it went down? No, I don't. But hopefully it helps illustrate how clever this concept really is. And there's more to the paper as well. They cover the stresses and whether the loading on the two discs is more or less even. And spoiler alert, it is. But talk is cheap, and I think it's time to bring this design into the real world. So I made a few refinements to the model. You know, to make it work. So it all starts with a bunch of pins. A lot of pins. So many pins. And I'm making these on the lathe, so the order of operations is to face, chamfer, and cut off each one. They then need to be flipped around and face down to length. And you could also do all this with a hacksaw, since the stock I'm using is already the right diameter. And where are all these pins going? Well, to start with, seven of them are pressed into the stage two housing, along with bearings to act as rollers. Then the whole housing gets installed into a large diameter bearing. The pins and rollers are supported on both sides to increase roller stiffness. So we need something to house this bearing, and this large plate should work perfectly. It just took a few tries to get the fit just right. Then the second stage housing and output bearing get installed into the plate. Next, we move on to the fixed stage one housing. And this has eight pins and rollers installed. And once again, the rollers are supported on both sides to increase stiffness. A lot of screws later, and the stage one housing was ready to go. And then there's the inner ring, which I'm now going to call the stage coupler. And this has six pins and bearings pressed in on each side to couple the motion of the two cycloidal discs. Some Loctite ensures the bearings will stay in place. Each cycloidal disc was designed to accommodate a bearing and retainer, and the eccentric shaft is a three-piece design to allow for installation of the stage coupler and discs. And you can see how it all comes together with a few spacers to maintain all the proper clearances. It took a bunch of test fits and reprints of both the shafts and the cycloidals to get everything working correctly. 3D printers are amazing, but sometimes their accuracy leaves a bit to be desired. And from here, it's just a matter of putting all the parts together. The cycloidal assembly is installed into the stage two housing first, and then capped off with the stage one housing. And hopefully this cross section view helps you understand how it all comes together. And you can see that the input shaft is supported on both sides of the drive. And a gap is maintained between the two stages to ensure that stage two's output can rotate freely. And next we need a frame to hold it all together and prevent the first stage from rotating. So I cut and drilled four lengths of aluminum extrusion. And these were bolted to captive nuts in the prints, in addition to a bunch of T-nuts that connected to the big plate. And that's the reducer put together. Now we just need a way to drive it. So I have this brushless motor lying around, which should be a pretty good fit for driving this reducer, but it doesn't have a shaft of any sort, which makes it tough to attach. So we need to do a quick aside and machine something up to help us out. So it's time to hop on over to the lathe to machine up a shaft. We need the shaft to fit tightly in the bore of the motor for alignment, and it has a flange where we can screw it to the outer motor bell. And a 10 millimeter keyed shaft will extend from the motor to drive the reducer. I didn't have any end mills small enough for the manual mill to cut the keyway, so it was over to the CNC to machine a slot into the shaft. Some quick manual work, and I had a key that could be pressed into the slot. Then the whole assembly was cleaned up on the mill, and holes were drilled in the flange that matched the hole pattern of the motor. And there we go, a keyed shaft that's ready to fit to our motor. Now we need a way to attach the motor body to the reducer, as well as a way to mount the encoder. 
so I printed up a motor enclosure, which includes a lot of venting. I also quickly machined up a smaller shaft for the other side to drive the encoder we'll need later. Four screws detach the motor to the drive, and that finishes up the assembly. So let's get this thing wired up to see if it all actually works. Now I'm using an O-drive to power the motor, and I'm limiting the current to 40 amps at 48 volts. And as you can see, it actually runs pretty smoothly, except the output is stuttering a little bit. So to try and get a baseline, we'll start by pressing on a scale with a lever arm attached to the drive. The point of contact is 36 inches from the center of rotation. And this should be a very unscientific way to determine how much torque we're getting from the reducer. And yeah, that cracking sound is bad news and the drive is no longer rotating. And I don't really think this result is very valid. So a quick dissection revealed that the stage two cycloidal disc had utterly exploded, but the stage one disc looked okay. And my initial theory was that the placement of these screw holes had weakened the structure. I also had suspicions that the blue filament is more brittle than the gray. And by the way, everything was printed in PETG, which I've usually found to be pretty shatter resistant. So I did a quick revision on the hole placement and reprinted the disc in gray this time. And it was time to give it another go. And this time I decided to attach a 2.2 pound weight to the bar. I started six inches from the center of rotation. And you can see that the drive had no problems lifting this. And at 12 inches, it also had no issues. But you might have noticed that the stuttering we saw before is getting worse. And so I continued testing, moving the weight six inches at a time until I got to 24 inches. And here the drive was really beginning to strain. You could see it and you could hear it. So I moved the weight another six inches, but my hopes were low. And it did actually manage to move the weight at 30 inches, but the struggle was real. And trying to repeat the test, the drive completely locked up. And you can see that the backlash at this point is off the charts. So I think we can safely call this a broken drive, but the failure wasn't nearly as dramatic as last time. And an inspection of the cycloidal discs reveals that the damage is definitely less exciting to look at. Instead, we're seeing indentations all over both discs where the rollers deform the plastic. And interestingly, we are seeing deformation on both the discs. And this does indicate that the paper was correct in that the loading of both discs is roughly equal. More than anything, I think this is really just a matter of the materials not being up to the task of withstanding all that torque. So despite the fact that this experiment was more or less a success, I just couldn't shake the idea that this design could be further optimized. And yeah, it turns out it totally could. So I designed two more reducers. But at this point, this video is getting long enough. So I'm gonna revisit this in the near future and see what else we can mine from the concept. And thanks for watching. Do you have any ideas for how you'd improve the concept? Please comment below and like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I think you know the drill. And thanks again to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video. Be sure to visit the link in the description to get major deals at their Black Friday flash sale. And remember to use my code YTE7P50 to get extra discounts and help support the channel. I'll see you on the next one.